Grace and peace to each one of you this morning. I'm so glad that you have come. You all look great. It's fun to see uh, some, you know, personalized masks. It's fun to see uh, everyone practicing safe COVID living so that we could gather together in person. Um, I've really been enjoying all of these Sundays that we have been able to have together in the sanctuary. So thank you for coming and and blessing our gathering with your presence this morning. I'm Marguerite Sarine, Transitional Pastor. I welcome also our live stream congregation out there, wherever you may be, as we turn to this hour on the day of our Lord to remember our Lord, to remember God's claim on our life, and what we are called to do with all the many blessings and gifts that even now God has given us. So welcome to this time of worship. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leslie Wickham. Join with me in the call to worship. If it had not been for God who was on our side, we would have fallen prey to those who want to harm us. We would have been swept away by sadness and fear. Blessed by the Lord, our protector. God has broken the snare that took away our freedom. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Alts by God's holy name, let us worship God. Now is the time when we. Yeah, are you guys doing the 
I didn't get one of these. Oh. <laughs> gotcha. For some reason, our papers are confusing us this morning. That's not the Presbyterian way, but I assure you, most of the time, we, we do try to be decent in an order. Um, so thank you, Leslie, for being here. <laughs> uh, so uh, we do worship by confessing. And we're going to hear more about that in our scripture passage this morning from James uh, that I'm excited to share with you. It's one of the key components of Christian discipleship. And it's a time where, you know, every prayer of confession, I'm always reminded every week, it always falls short of really getting to the heart of the matter that a lot of times we just don't even know what we really do need to confess, except that we know that we are in need of grace and that we worship a God that wants to do nothing but extend grace to those who don't deserve it. So let us confess now together in that confidence um, in our God. We'll begin with a moment of silent and individual confession, and then we'll join together in our corporate prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for hearing the prayers of your people, what's on their hearts. And now hear us as we pray together saying, God of unity, we live in a world where our lives move between inclusivity and exclusivity. We often move toward the latter, trying to oust from our circles those who do not think like us, act like us, or look like us. Forgive our need to reject and to always be on the lookout for those things that make us different. Give us the eyes of our teacher who knows unconditional love and compassion and sees us all as one, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. And part of Christ's healing work in the world is reconciling us to God and reconciling us one to another, connecting us with all that we have in common, which so far outweighs our differences. And in this, we can celebrate, have assurance, forgiveness, and new life. Friends, believe the good news. Amen. Our scripture this morning, as I mentioned, will be coming to us from the epistle again. From James, this will be the last lectionary Sunday that we study this epistle, so we're reading from the last chapter, verses 13 through 20. James is ending his letter, giving the early church some very concrete steps toward what they should do to live in to their Christian calling. He writes, Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another. You should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death 
and will cover a multitude of sins. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I had to preach this sermon on this passage because that was one of my mother's favorite phrases from the Bible. And I didn't even know that this was the book that it was from until I was studying this week. She used to always talk about a multitude of sins. I don't know if it was because of us four kids or that <laughs> her pastor growing up had James as his favorite book or where she got it, but she was always saying, oh, that's just a multitude of sins. But even before we get to that, and I will get, uh, speak quite a bit on that um, last paragraph in the passage. If we go from the beginning, James is really setting out concrete steps for these disciples to do. We are to pray. We are to confess. And we are to sing praises. Well, I don't know about you, but when I read that list, I'm like, wow, we do all of those things in worship every Sunday. Well, Maybe not singing praises so much these days, but one day, you guys, we'll, we'll be singing with you as you play your music over there. But it's just a real reminder how even our worship services are designed to remind us the basic fundamentals of Christian discipleship. Pray, confess, sing praises, and how we relate to one another. James has a lot to say about this. And yet, even though he's talking about fundamentals of our faith, that we are all called to practice, two parts of what he says trouble me, and I can understand why Martin Luther has some issues with this book, because some of what he's saying is a little hard to hear, especially for Presbyterians who don't usually have evangelism committees to go save the souls of those who are wandering from the truth. At least I've never been asked at any Presbyterian church, would I please form such a committee and lead people to go do that? So I'm going to talk about that, but I'm also going to talk about what James says about prayer. When he says the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up, we in the church know better than anybody because we're praying for people on our prayer list all the time that sometimes they don't get healed. They don't get better. They don't get raised up in the way that we are often praying for them too. So that sounds like James is giving us one of those biblical promises that our experience is going to argue with and we don't know whether to take that seriously. So that's what troubles me about what he says about it. But I think we have to hear this passage from the first century when he wrote it, where mortality for infants stood at 30% of births. That's three, zero, 30% of infants in the first century died upon birth, and the life expectancy was about 35, which meant that for every infant that dies, somebody might make it to 70. So death was so much more a part of everybody's life. And life after death was as imminent and as important to deal with as what you were going to eat for dinner that night. It was that close to us all the time. It's hard to believe that all of our miraculous advances through the centuries, the last couple of centuries, have brought us to a point where that's such an alien way of living. But that's how most of human life has been lived in that context. So James is not just talking about prayer saving people from physical death. He's talking about prayer saving them from the condemnation after death that was very much on everybody's minds and fears. There are so many ways that God works out salvation for each one of us. We all have our particular thorns in the flesh, our particular proclivities to wander, and God comes to us right where their, those particular proclivities are to meet us with saving grace. I know that each of us can tell a story about that. I know I can. But the prayers of the righteous is 
almost like James is saying, if you're righteous enough, what you pray for will come to pass. And I want to say that that is not what I think we should take away from this passage. For all of you have prayed for something that did not come to pass as you had hoped. Does that mean that God is unfaithful? That God does not love you? Or that is it just a reminder that God is serious when Jesus tells us the prayer that we are to pray is thy will on earth as it is in heaven. And we say that every Sunday we are reminded, woo, that is a mighty prayer. If we can actually mean that and let go of what we would want our will to be and to say God's will must be righteous. The way and the truth and the life, even if it's not what I want. So I think that when I read the whole of James, that we don't take these, these little bits about prayer out of context and think that that's what the Bible is telling us that prayer does for us. Prayer always brings back God's sovereignty to us. And that prayer brings us into, at the foot of the throne of that sovereignty and to, and to find our peace and our hope there and not so much in what we would have our will to be. All right, so that's how I get out of the trouble about the prayer part. How am I going to get out of the trouble about the evangelism part? So we are Presbyterians. And like I said, Nobody here has mentioned to me, Marguerite, when are you going to put together an evangelism committee? We don't see ourselves commissioned to go bring those wandering sinners back to the truth. And um, I have to admit, I kind of like that about Presbyterians. Um, and yet, and yet, if we didn't think that we didn't have some part of the truth in the way that we hear and interpret scripture in the Presbyterian church and the way that we practice discipleship and the way that we are called to do our community and our service, I'm not sure we would be here. There's got to be some pull of truth that we feel so deeply that we're willing to invest the time and treasure that you all invest in making the gospel a living witness in this community. So what, what do we make of what James is saying here? That everyone who brings a wanderer back to the truth covers a multitude of sins. Well, because we are Presbyterian and we confess our sin every Sunday and we are continually saying that we need to reform because we haven't gotten it right yet, I think that in some way, if church is really being church, we recognize that it's not just those folks out there, those sinful, secular, non-church goers that are wandering from the truth. We're all wandering from the truth. The church has wandered from the truth more times than it would like to admit. And the community that we create as a church, if we're really being church the way that I think James is describing here, is that we know, we confess we're wandering from the truth, and yet when we gather around the word and the table and singing praises and praying and confessing, we help bring each other back. We're helping bring each other back. That's what we're doing every Sunday. Because we're trying to figure out what's going on out there and what do we do about it? What's true? What's not? Golly, it's just, I believe it really must be harder today than it's ever been because we have so many voices coming at us claiming truth. So we're all wandering, maybe more than ever, and this hour, this time that we come together and the work that we do as a church we bring each other back and we say well this is what I think is the truth and that's what you think is the truth is different how is God working in this and something 
exciting and grace-filled comes out of that. Every time, I've been seeing it here for over a year, and it's going on right now in this church. The mission study goals that the congregation identified in the spring are being adopted by the session and then delegated to the committees whose work most closely aligns with those goals to figure out, let's go wander after what we think is the truth of God's call on us right now. And we'll find something out that will probably call us back, correct our course a little bit. Hopefully we'll make mistakes because then we'll really be doing discipleship, going out there, following God's call, and then bringing each other back closer to the truth when we find that we've wandered, as we will, all of us. This is fun. This is fun stuff. Not to think that because we are church-going Presbyterians and Christians that we're going to go find all those enlightened people out there and bring them back to our truth the way that we see it, unless it's just, well, we know that we don't see it fully, but let's have a conversation and see where God leads us into a more full understanding of that truth. And how exciting is that? I mean, that's how our vision statement that, that came out of the mission study helps us focus on this direction that we feel God is calling us to follow. One of the goals that came out of that mission study was to align our budget with this vision statement. So finances have been a top priority since I arrived here, and we've got new people stepping in right now to help out with the committee in this new vision of how do we align our budget with our vision statement. And the question of bringing wanderers back to the truth can be as well, I was going to say is boring, but it's not boring. But as simple as making sure our financial reports clearly reflect how our treasure is helping the vision become reality. And if it's not, then we're wandering away and we need to be brought back. So the committees are really starting to grapple with these questions that the congregation has asked them to grapple with. Now, how does all of this cover a multitude of sins? Well, I think I've, I've mentioned a little bit about that, that if we take a traditional view of evangelism, that we've got the truth and we have to go convert people to the truth as we understand it, that we've already created a hierarchy, that we have superior knowledge and the wanderer is deficient and we need to save them, I just don't think James would even agree with that interpretation. I think James's conclusion in this letter is that a multitude of sins is covered when we are brought back to the truth by someone who understands that they need to be brought back to. For if it happens to one person, it ought to happen to the second. A multitude of sins is covered when this happens between two people. A multitude of sins is not committed when one person is trying to make the other person believe the same way they do. So to be evangelistic in this way, to know and experience and believe that your faith has been good for you, maybe even has saved your life already in some way, is not an excuse to put others through some sort of conversion, inquisition. It's something we should sing praises for every day. It's something that we should ask, God, how do I use this to serve? In humility, it is not a license to lord over anyone, a notion that our experience of grace gives us the right to be superior to their understanding because together we learn how we would love and serve God. Together we learn how we need to bring each other back from the wandering that we are always going to do. So friends, I invite you 
into this kind of discipleship because there are opportunities to live into it all over this church right now. Every single committee. We call them committees, and that sounds so dry. Those committees and the session, the diaconate, are working out their faith with fear and trembling. And as we do this together, wandering and bringing each other back, we will have nothing but grace to sing praises for and to give thanks to God and to bring that gratitude into a world so longing to be freed into the truth of all that it should be grateful for. Friends, we have this gift. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Marguerite. Now we come to prayers of the people. Now is the time when we remember the cares of others, not to absolve ourselves of them, but to be mindful of them and open ourselves to any possibility that we can share in God's answer to their prayers. Bow with me. Holy God, we pray this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus, our only power. Give this world the will to follow the Master's example, to love as he did, to speak as he spoke, to behave as he behaved, so that this world can become more like the world you envisioned. Mighty God, give this world the will to act on behalf of your Son, to speak the truth in love, to seek out justice when an injustice arises, to discern your will, and to be the living witness of Jesus Christ. Loving God, give this world the will to honor your Son's name, as we are one family whose successes and achievements reflect that we are sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters of Jesus, and are the joy of the whole body. Healing God, give the world the power of your name, that name that is so powerful it can heal the sick, destroy all evil, give freedom to those in chains, and save each one of us. We pray this in the name that is above every name, the power of our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to leave and serve the Lord, please maintain social distancing as you exit the doors of the Narsex. You're also welcome to stay and listen to the postlude. Once in the Narsex, we ask that you keep going through the Narsex and take a left to exit the side door down the entrance ramp. There's shade there and better footing, and we can all take off our mask if we choose. As you go, please note the baskets in the narthex where you can place your offerings for today. We will use your offerings to seek humbly God's will for our church as we minister to our community. Now the charge and blessing. Friends, Pray, confess to God and to one another. Sing when you can, safely. Sing loud and long praises of thanksgiving for all the many blessings. And trust 
and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Righteous One, whose will should be done on earth as it is in heaven, this day and every day. Amen. Thank you.